hey, I just do an office will do good here. You know, sometimes people say to me, hey, how are you able to go down the dark alley when you know those people there maybe with guns and not be afraid? You know how? Because I pray a lot. That's right, I talk to God as much as I can. Sometimes when I'm walking down the street, if you know what I mean. Here's what I'm saying to you. Maybe you're not in a situation where you have to walk down a dark alley where there might be people there with guns. Uh, maybe not, but we all have our dark alleys. We all have different things in our lives where we worry about what's going to happen. Uh, you know what I'm saying? We all need to pray. When we pray, God by His Holy Spirit who lives inside of us, the Spirit of God, talks back to our hearts so that we know what to do. That's why the Bible says we should pray. We should think of God as our Heavenly Father and talk to Him and then He will talk back to our hearts. This is Officer Duguid saying, be prayerful, talk to God. Okay, I need Brian Jennings to come on up here. Brian? Now many of you know Brian, he's a long-standing member of the church and and we have a team that goes down every year to Nicaragua to do uh, short-term missions. A lot of that missions work involves construction. Uh, sometimes helping to expand the, the orphanage down there, that sort of thing. And Brian's usually the lightning rod. Is that, is that okay to say that, Brian? Usually the lightning, lightning rod, one of the lightning rods for, for stuff that has to do with carpentry. So I want to I turn, as, as an introduction to what I'm going to say today, I wanted to speak a little bit uh, on certain things, and I want Brian to introduce that. Brian, go well, ahead. Um, am I live? Can you hear me? Okay. Several years ago, I was traveling back from northern Indiana and was just casually listening to the radio as I picked up a program that was a uh, consultant. It was a psychiatrist who was giving advice. And a young lady had called and just asked a very, very simple question. She says, how do I live a normal life? And I thought, wow, that's, that's a great simple question to listen to the consultant give a very elaborate secular perspective on what a normal life was I thought well <clears throat> I'm gonna look up that word normal when I get home as I arrived home I picked up the dictionary and got an old one because I wanted to use one of the older terms or one of the older references and I looked up the word normal and it came from derived from the word normalis which is a Latin word it didn't surprise me it came from a Latin word, but what did surprise me was what it meant in Latin. It meant made according to the carpenter square. That's what normal is. I got thinking about that. Ah, so maybe it's not so much the square as it is knowing who the carpenter is. We know that Jesus was a carpenter. And this is a carpenter square in case you don't know what a carpenter square is. And my understanding from my construction experience that if you don't have a square, you can't have the right angle. You can't have the right perspective. Matter of fact, if you don't get square with God, you're not going to be able to square things off in your building. So think about it. Um, I just think it's an interesting way to look at what a normal life is. Having the right square. Amen. Now, in your bulletin, you've got, you've got a carpenter square. Go ahead and find your carpenter square, right? I'm going to call an audible today. The title of the sermon is The Carpenter Square. It's still in our study in the Gospel of Mark. It's still in the next section. But I'm going to take a different angle on it. So, uh, here... Uh, uh, and, different angle. <laughs> different angle. Yeah, thanks. So, <laughs> here's what we're going to do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, here's, here's what we're going to do this morning. Uh, Brian's going to go around with the carpenter's toolbox. And, and I want you all to think of two people. So you're going to write one on this side, one on this side. Two people that you have on your heart, or you should have on your heart, who need to know who Jesus is. Who need to see the carpenter. Who need to begin to live their lives according to the carpenter's square. Because, Brian, now, if I'm not mistaken, if you don't use that thing, then the more further away you get from the point of the angle, the, the more mistakes you're going to make, Right? That's the kind of the idea. I want you to write those two names on your carpenter square. And Brian's going to pass around the carpenter's toolbox. And you're going to put those names in the toolbox. And we're going to start praying as a church that those people, not only will you be able to share your faith with them, but as time is appropriate and as someone, you're going to invite them to come to a church, hopefully this church, with you. With you. There's nothing like a personal invitation. There's nothing like walking with somebody when you're walking with the Lord. So Brian, go ahead, and I'm, as he's going, I'm going to tell you another, another story. 
when I was, uh, before, I, before I fully went into full-time ministry, as some of you know, I was a uh, resort manager. I was a resort manager. I used to manage timeshare resorts. The third timeshare resort I did was called Laguna Surf. Michaela, do you remember Laguna Surf? Right on the ocean. Beautiful, incredible view in California, in Laguna Beach, California. And so I took over that resort, and shortly after I got there, the maintenance manager, the maintenance guy, he said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to be leaving. I need to move out. Of, I, I think he was moving out of the state. I'm not, I'm trying to remember that. But so pretty soon I had to put, I had a space available. I had a job available for anybody who was going to give me an application for a carpenter, for a, for a maintenance guy. So one guy comes in to apply. His name was Wayne Williard. Wayne, if you're out there on the internet, love you, brother. Still remember you. Wayne Williard comes in. Now this guy was a big guy, strong guy. He had been a Navy SEAL. Now we have a lot of Navy SEALs in the news. His name was Wayne Williard and he came in and he, he said, I'm just going to level with you. I'm battling cancer. No one will hire me. But if you hire me, I will be the best maintenance man you ever had. So I kind of looked at his resume, looked at him, and just looked at the fire in his eyes, and I said, Welcome to Lagoon Surf. Now I'll give you guys a little tip. If any of you guys are in a position of management or a boss of somebody, guys that have been in the military are like gold. They are gold. And here's why. Because he understood the chain of command. He understood how to take orders. And he would, he would come and say, well, you know, this is what I think. This is what I feel. Uh, but whatever you say, I'm going to do. And he did. For example, he would say to me, you know, uh, you've got that little place up there. And if, if you walked into that resort, you had the counter, and it was all decorated with shells and fishermen's nets. It was kind of nice. Uh, and then you had a little stairway that went up to a sort of what you might call an attic. And, and my, my desk and my computer was back there. And this, this even predates email, so it was a computer for, for writing a, a lot of paperwork, getting a lot of paperwork done. But he said to me, you need to have a proper office where you can block yourself off and not, and not be subject to all the noise and the, and the traffic that comes in here. So he took out one of these. And he started measuring stuff and writing stuff down. And I said, well, what's it? He told me. And he built me the neatest office area that you can imagine. He, he kind of made the wall a certain way. He, had, he put, moved my desk. He kind of put the, the, the little storage area right here. And, and you could come up and it was actually an office. And then he comes to me and he said, you know, my experience with uh, construction tells me that you've got evidence here of some water damage after you're right on the beach. And if you don't want to avoid a big, big problem with your insurance, you need to kind of submit that right now. So I brought Wayne with me to the meeting of the association there. And, and they got it fixed, and he saved the resort tons of money. Eventually, eventually, when I left, he moved to Florida. He took his carpenter square, put it in his toolbox, just like that one, and he moved to Florida. I never forgot that. But one thing I learned was, we have a lot to learn from a carpenter. Turn your Bible to um, Mark chapter 8. Verse 34. Now the background is he had said to his disciples, now who do people say that I am? And they said, well, some say you're this prophet, that prophet. But who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ. Uh, to, to Peter, that meant the one who's going to come and rescue us. 
And Jesus says, yes, I'm him and I'm coming to rescue you, but now here's what this is going to look like. I'm going to die on the cross and raise on the third day. And Peter said, oh, no, 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 no. That's not what's going to happen. So Jesus turned to Peter and said, you know, get behind me, Satan. In other words, he's, he's telling Peter that he's unfortunately being the mouthpiece for the enemy at that moment. He said, you're looking at man's interests and not God's interests. And this is the next section. Verse 34. And he, Jesus, summoned the crowd with his disciples. So just, just picture this. Jesus knows that the Peter problem is a problem for everybody. And he wants to nip this thing in the bud right now. And what he's about to say to Peter, he said, you know what? I'm going to say this to everybody. And by extension, he's going to say it to us. He summoned the crowd with his disciples and he said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now some of you Bible scholars out there, we know that God loves to speak in parables and he loves to speak with symbols. He frankly told Moses that he would speak in riddles and dark sayings. That's what gives us permission to look at the Bible and see sort of not just literal meanings, but spiritual meanings. So in the Bible, tell me what wood stands for. Anybody? This is not original with me. Most evangelical theologians will tell you this. Wood is a symbol of fallen man because Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, they, they ate from the tree, right, of the knowledge of good and evil. And... Jesus was from Nazareth. Nazareth means the branch in Hebrew. And he was a carpenter. So he came to make useful things out of wood. A carpenter makes useful things out of wood. A carpenter knows the difference between oak wood and cherry wood and olive wood. What's strong? What's not as strong? What's good to mold and shape? What's maybe better to have weight on it? He knows all of us. He's a carpenter. He sees all of us. Right? Fallen humanity. And he's come to make useful things out of all of us. And how did he die? On a cross of wood. Because it was the sins of fallen humanity that was the reason that for his death. Was the reason that he had to come and sacrifice himself. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. The Son of God and God the Son. He was sent as the Lamb of God. The one who was going to take our sins. He took the punishment that we deserve for our sins. His blood is atonement for our sins. Then he raised, he raised from the dead so we could live with him forever in heaven. So Jesus Christ died on a cross of wood. Everybody following me so far? So Jesus Christ is saying here, now, if you want to be my disciple, you have to get with the program. And in case you're wondering what the program is, I'm going to tell you. The program is not just that I'm dying as a blood atonement, but this cross, you know, this, okay, this cross, it's a picture of the normal Christian life. The normalis, the carpenter's standard. In general, you got to live a life that is going to think of the other person more than you think of yourself. And in, in general, think of God more than you think of yourself. The cross. You got to take up your cross and follow me. How are we going to do that? Didn't Jesus tell us in other passages that we're naturally selfish, we're naturally sinful? How are we going? How are we going to take this cross? How are we going to willingly take a cross? So when I ask you that question, what should be your, your response? You should have another question come back at me. Remember we talked about this? You should know the four Gospels. And whenever, whenever there's a question, you've got to ask the question now. If, okay, so the question is, how is it that we're enabled? How, how can we, how is it that we can be able to take up our cross? The answer is, how was it that Jesus was able to take up his cross? Turn to Mark chapter 14. Verse 32. 
they came to a place called Gethsemane. And he, Jesus, said to his disciples, Sit here until I have prayed. And took with him Peter, James, and John, and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And he, Jesus, went a little beyond them, fell upon the ground, and began to pray that if it were possible, the, uh, this hour might pass from him. And he, Jesus, was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. How was Jesus able to take up his cross? You know, when I, before I became a Christian, a serious Christian, and I would hear people talk about the Bible, it just, my eyes just glazed over. It was just a bunch of religious talk. And as, as you know, I had a background before I was a resort manager being in a rock band. So I was actually against it. I didn't understand it anyway. So I feel like my job now <laughs> is to make this as simple as possible. It's as simple as possible. When Jesus says, take up your cross, we're tempted to glaze our eyes over because it's just a bunch of religion, right? It's actually kind of simple. The carpenter's square is the carpenter's prayer. The one you just heard. You start out with Abba, Daddy. Abba, Father. Daddy, please. And you end with, nevertheless. Those are, the two, those are the two things right here. Okay, Daddy, please. Nevertheless. Remember we talked about how Paul says that when you walk in with the Lord, you have to understand and keep in balance both the goodness and the severity of God. The goodness of God. God is your Father. The nurturing. And the severity of God. That He's the Almighty King of the universe who is worthy to be obeyed. Yes, sir. So when you pray, that's what you do. You start out by saying, Abba, Father. Daddy, when you pray, you increase, I've said this before, I'm going to say it again, you increase the quality of your father-child moments with God. You walk with Him in your heart. You try to, you do business with Him, you say, I'm desperately sorry for things that come between us. I want to be close to you. Abba, Father, that's the first thing. And then you, you go ahead and say, please, just like a child would say to a father. But then, you say, nevertheless, whatever you say, I'm going to do. You humble yourself and you submit to him as your king. He is your father and your king. That's how you carry your cross. Now trust me on this. If you just think, well, I'm going to be religious and I'm going to keep a bunch of rules, you will not be able to sustain it. If you could, then you wouldn't need the New Testament at all. Jesus came to die for us so that God could send His Holy Spirit. He could forgive us. Send His Holy Spirit inside of us so that it, the Holy Spirit cries out with our spirit, Abba, Father, so that we are motivated to do what's right. This is not rocket science. Let's pretend for a minute that you, that you, you know, want to stop smoking. Let's take two people. Two people that smoke cigarettes. If you're smoking cigarettes, it doesn't mean that you're condemned. It's just you need to stop because it's not healthy. But anyway... Two people, right? Who's more likely to stop smoking? This guy over here, you're telling him he's going to get sick? Or this guy over here who has a daughter who says, Daddy, I want you to be around for my wedding. Who do you think is going to stop smoking? It's this guy. Because he's motivated by love. Father to child love. 
Every time he looks at his daughter, he's thinking, I, I've got to stop. And he puts down this pack of cigarettes. Is this guy going to, he'll try. He'll, he'll do it for a few weeks maybe, but after a while, eh. I got too much stress. That's how it works. We need to be motivated by the carpenter's square. The carpenter's square is the carpenter's prayer. This is the carpenter's prayer. Daddy, please. Nevertheless. That's how you take up your cross. That's how you live a, a life that, generally speaking, is, not, is, is aimed at others rather than yourself. You know, it's an exciting time for our church, you know. Uh, we've known for a long time that, that the uh, owner of this property uh, was kind of waiting for the economy to change so that he could sell the property and that eventually we would have to move to a different location. Well, that time has come. We've got about six months. And, and the, the elders and the staff and so on were kind of actually excited about it. Even though it's kind of a, you know, like, like the Officer Do Good clip, it's like a dark alley and, you know, he's just got to pray, right? But it seems like what the Lord is saying is, you know, time to get back to basics and do this thing right. You can pray for us. The elders are going to have a meeting after church and as we start to kind of commiserate and, and strategize and ask for God's wisdom. But the first thing we need to do is, is, is agree on a prayer strategy. I have some ideas, but I'm sure they have some. Because prayer is the engine that runs the whole deal. God does nothing apart from prayer. And the prayer, the first prayer, is this one. This is the first one. That we need to have, as a church, we need to have the right, we need to have the right focus. We need to write the names of some outsiders on this little piece of paper and, and put it in the carpenter's toolbox. We need to remember why we're here, why we're at church. It's not to, you know, steal Christians from other churches that don't really need us. Because, you know, hey, it's a new thing. You know, suppose we, get a, a, suppose we go to a, you know, we move to a movie theater and somebody says, well, that's cool. That's cool. Let's see what that's like. We, we, want, we want to have you guys, me, all of us, inviting people to come to church. Why? Because I care about you. I, I care. I kind of want to do life with you. And here's what Jesus means to me. He's, God is saying, you know, he's saying, we're going to build the church, but it's not a building. We're going to build the church. We, we're going to have people that, that are unchurched or need to be rechurched. I, I was one of those that needed to be rechurched. Okay, I when I was growing up, my parents would drag me to church. The, what's the old saying? I had a drug problem. I was drugged to church. <laughs> well, the problem is, is that you know, just like just like when you get an inoculation, you get just enough of the weak the weak germs so that you don't, can't catch the real thing, as they say. That was my problem. <laughs> I had gotten just enough of the of a weaker version. It was my fault, not their fault. So that I, felt I couldn't catch the real thing. And so I needed to be rechurched. And it was, it was a guy, it's funny, it, it's, it's coming back to me. Robert Caseman, if you're out there on the internet, thank you. He was a carpenter. Another guy. Plain spoken man. Strong hands, rough hands. Honest day's work. And I was a hippie. I had my hair out to here. But they hired me in this choir and it, they were really sort of, uh, um, I want to say theologically liberal, is that, is that probably the way to put it? So that, so that it didn't matter, that, which is probably a good thing. <laughs> didn't matter, I was up there singing. But this guy, he's not the sort of person that would, would decide that he's going to be nice to me. You, you think? I mean, I don't know, I, I don't think. But he would always say my name, always with a smile, always shaking my hand. And, and when I told him, you know, I, 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 it's a long story, but I had read this book and prayed a prayer at the end, and, and I, I didn't know what I had done. I said, Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. I want to follow you. And, and I told him that. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, there's a lot more. You know, I'm going to go on a retreat weekend. Can I, can I kind of do that, do that for you? Come with me. 
changed my life. Changed my life. It was called Tres Dias Weekend. I went in this weekend and, and uh, learned about praying and going to church and having Christian friends and serving other people and having a heart for the needy and, and, and all this stuff. How to read the Bible and how to understand it. I was a changed person. See, the carpenter's square is the carpenter's prayer. I have a funny feeling that he went to the Lord in prayer and the Lord said, I want you to talk to him. And maybe he said, but daddy, <laughs> that guy? Nevertheless, at your word, I'll reach out to him. I've got nothing in common with him. Nothing. And he'll probably say no. But I'll do that. I'll invite him. He was probably more surprised. He was probably the most surprised guy in the world when I said, you know what? Yeah. I'll do that. He probably went, what? <laughs> Lord, what do I do now? Well, that's what we're going to do. Be praying for those people you wrote down. Be praying that you'll get to share with them. And when you're feeling like you don't really want to share what Jesus means to you because, you know, you're not a public speaker or you're just embarrassed or you're just afraid of being accused of being a proselytizer or whatever, you're going to need to pray the carpenter's prayer and say, Daddy, please. Nevertheless, It's an exciting time. God is going to focus us now in a way we've never been focused before. And it's an honor to be able to share the word with you. Let me close with this. Go ahead and go back to Mark chapter 8. 34 through 38. We're going to start at... Um, read that again. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake, and the Gospels, and the Gospels, and the outsider, will save it. For what does it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he, Jesus, the Son of Man, comes in the glory of his Father, and the holy angels. If you're like me and you're thinking in your heart, you know, it's maybe it's later than we think. Right? We're getting kind of close to Jesus coming, hallelujah. All the more reason to get out your carpenter square. All of us together. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, it's, it's an amazing thing that you have done for us. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for us. And thank you that you speak to us with the heart of a carpenter wanting to make useful things out of wood. Please help us as we go forward to pray the carpenter's prayer and in a new and fresh way do what we know we're supposed to do. Help us, Lord, to reach out 
to those who need to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.